chapter 4. You know, this message I actually intended to give around Christmas time. And, uh, <laughs> does anybody remember that Disney cartoon? I guess it was, I don't know, probably in like the 60s or something, The Jungle Book? And uh, I'm not talking about the, the live action one, that, that from like the 90s, that was terrible. I'm also not talking about the live action that just came out like, I don't know, last year or whatever. I'm talking about the, the cartoon with, with, with Blue where he sings the song, Bare Necessities. Mm -hmm. You guys remember that? Yeah. Now, I, I think Blue was supposed to kind of be like, like a hippie or something, you know? Uh, because he was all like, you know, oh, I don't need anything, I'm just gonna live off the land and do my thing, right? <laughs> But actually, Baloo has great wisdom for us, <laughs> um, and, and, and that's kind of where I got the name for this. Uh, this message is called Bare Necessities, because if you remember, you remember what he says in the song, you know, hey, forget about your worries and your strife. You know, if you find out you can live without it, then move along, not thinking about it. You know, and it, 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 it's kind of really captures, I think, the essence of, uh, of this message, because what's Christmas all about, right? For, for most people, Christmas is all about the gifts, all about getting the, your kids the right things so they don't flip out at you, right? And in fact, there, a couple years ago, there was this, these uh, videos that were being posted online about kids who got these Christmas gifts and it wasn't what they wanted, but they were really expensive gifts. Like, for instance, instead of the iPad, it was just tablet. You know, which is, tablets are still expensive, especially back then, you know, they just came out and everybody's like, oh, it's like a phone meets a computer. And, uh, uh, you know, and all these kids flipping out that they didn't get it, get the, the, the name brand iPad, you know. And uh, for a lot of people, that's what Christmas is all about, you know. At the end of the, at the, end of the holidays, it's, it's always, what did you get, you know. Not, uh, not hey, Jesus was born, good news, right? It's, it's, it's what did you get. And uh, especially for, for family gatherings, you know, um, you feel it's almost like a pressure to, to prove that, that you love somebody by how elaborate of a gift you can give them. And if it's inexpensive or if it's homemade, that's just throwaway nonsense. And it, but if it's the name brand, top of the notch, you spent thousands of dollars going into credit card debt to buy this, then that's a good gift, you know. And, uh, and most of us spend a good deal of time thinking about what we want and what we like to change, right? We always think about what we want to change in our lives. We always think about what we want. Uh, for those of you who shop on Amazon, you know the wish list. It's always growing longer, right? <laughs> And oh man, I tell you, Amazon, that, that site gets me in trouble because it's so easy to just push the button and you've got like these 20 things you wanted for a really long time already sent to your house. It's like, yes, praise Jesus. But the thing is, is it's actually not that great of a thing because of how easy it is. You know, especially with credit cards, you, you don't really even pay attention that you're, you're spending the money. And it's kind of a mindset I want to talk about, not so much just owning a bunch of stuff, but that mindset of never being content with where you are. And in direct contrast, as Paul once wrote, if we have clothes and food, with this we'll be content. You know, that's just a complete contrast to what America tells us, because we grow up hearing that we have to have better and bigger, and we have to keep getting, and, you know, surely if you get the next thing, you'll be happy. And, and we go our whole lives thinking this, you know. We invest in an expensive house. We spend our whole life building our house into something bigger and better, and, you know, making it everything we always wanted. And by the time that it's finished, we're 60 years old, and we don't have that long to enjoy it. Yeah. Sorry, Joe. We're 80 years old, and we don't have that long to enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean it like that, Joe. Um, yeah, it's more like 90. <laughs> and when, we have to kind of ask ourselves, when will, when will it be enough? When is enough enough? You know, how long before you're satisfied? Pastors said that quote from I forget who, but there's two people who aren't happy: uh, those people who are who are trying to get more, and those people who already have it. You know, it, neither of them are happy because the one who got it, they found out that that's not actually what makes them happy. And then those people who don't have it, they think surely they will be happy if only they have that thing. And uh, so, when will it be enough? When will you be happy and satisfied? What has to happen in your life for you to be content in your life? Now. A lot of us feel that in, in our hearts. I'm not content. But if we actually stop and think about it, okay, so what has to happen for us to be content? The, most of, the majority of the time, we actually don't have it narrowed down to one thing. Well, I don't know, but I'm not happy. So what has to happen for you to be happy? Well, I don't know. I mean, maybe there would be no problems in life. Okay, 
So then God takes us to places in our lives where all of our problems go away, it seems. And it seems like we're just overflowing with blessings and we're still not happy. So then God brings us by financial troubles. And okay, if the financial troubles would go away, if my health would be better, if all these things, if, 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 surely then. And, and the truth is that, that life doesn't really go like that. And I know this is mind-blowing, but what if true happiness came in having less? Mind-blowing, right? Especially growing up in America where you hear that it's always about more, more and more and more. So we're reading out of Mark chapter 4. And it starts in, uh, in verse 1. He began to teach again by the sea, and such a very large crowd gathered to him that he got into a boat in the sea and sat down. And the whole crowd was by the sea on the land, and he was teaching them many things in parables. He was saying to them in his teaching, listen to this. Behold, the sower went out to sow. As he was sowing, some seed fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of soil. And after the sun had risen, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Verse 7, other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. Other seeds fell into the good soil, and as they grew up and increased, they yielded a crop and produced thirty, sixty, and a hundredfold. And, and he was saying, he who has to ears, I'm sorry, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. As soon as he was alone, his followers, along with the twelve, began asking him about the parables, and he was saying to them, to you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God, but those who are outside get everything in parables, so that while seeing they may see and not perceive, and while hearing they may hear and not understand. Otherwise they might return and be forgiven. So let's stop there. And in and, and verse 13, he starts kind of explaining this parable. I don't really want to get too much into that, though. Um, I highly recommend you to read through the Bible. Um, it's Obviously there's always something to learn if you've already read it. I was reading statistics about... Um, how many people have read the Bible through all the way, and it's in the teens, like it's like 12 or 15 percent, and, and whoever's re read it through all the way multiple times is like so small it's not even funny. Anyways, um, but I think the reason why things like pornography have come up a lot more in recent times isn't just because we have a lust. I mean, that's obvious. Guys like sex, girls like sex, people want to feel like they're loved and they want to feel like they belong. That's obvious, right? But I think our culture's fascination with pornography goes beyond that. Because for those of you who have ever been in pornography, you know they have a porn for literally everything. They make porns off popular television shows. They make it off of video games. You know, they make it off of everything. You can literally find any combination of sexual things online. Any combination. And yet, people who look at porn are never satisfied. There's never that one video that completely satisfies them. They always have to go again. They always have to watch more videos. Well, I'm confused. Surely, with the abundance of pornography, the sexual lust could be resolved. And yet it's not. Well, I thought my wife was the problem. It's her fault that, that I'm sexually frustrated. She doesn't have sex with me enough or whatever. See what I mean? It, it's all their fault. Well, pornography gives us the perfect example of hypothetically what would happen if you could switch your wives out. Because Jesus said, when you lust in your heart, you're committing it. So pornography absolutely is wrong. But I, 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 I want to I look at the idea there of not being satisfied. Maybe it's not our spouse's fault that we're not satisfied. Maybe it's not our finances of why we're not satisfied. Maybe it's not our living situation. Maybe it's not our family. Maybe it's not those people who set those things against us. Maybe it's not our Facebook not having as many friends as we want. Or whatever you guys have your own problems with. See what I mean? Maybe what if those things that you think are making you not happy have nothing to do with your happiness? What if? Blows your mind, okay? Because just like pornography, Things are like pornography. We have so many options in life, but temptation always comes back. Things are just like pornography. You can find any house, and if, you, if it doesn't exist, you can have somebody build it for you. There's any combination of video games. There's all kinds of technology, technology to choose from. You literally can have whatever you want in America. And if you can't afford it, fear not, there are credit cards. Like, 
Literally, you can get whatever you want in America, yet people are very not happy. Well, why is that? And here's the, the real kicker. There's less pleasure the more you do it. People who are on pornography have to look at more porn and different videos. And they have to keep doing it. And they have to do it for longer. And they have to go to more, um, as to say, intense videos. Because their lust is, is never satisfied. In fact, it gets worse. The same is true for when we buy things. We buy something and it makes us happy for a time. So we buy something else and it makes us happy for a shorter amount of time. And a shorter amount of time. So we keep buying stuff to try and make us happy, all the while realizing that the thing itself is what's making us not happy. Crazy, right? Now, hold on. I'll come back to this, okay? So there's less pleasure the more you do it. It's like this. Wealth, possessions, and the world, they drain us. They're always draining us. The more things you have, that means that the faster you are spiritually being drained. The more money you have is the more stuff you have to worry about. The more belongings you have is the more belongings that can get stolen and broken. See, it's constantly draining us spiritually, but we convince ourselves, surely God wants me to prosper in this life, and he has to give me everything that I want so that I'll be happy. Because God wants me to be happy. Well, that sounds really good on paper, but that's not actually what the Bible says. Read through the Gospel of Locke. Luke, Locke is in the Gospel. Read through the Gospel of Luke and see how many times he talks about giving away your possessions. And then go to, go to Acts and see how many times he says, and they gave all that they had. They were sharing things in common good. So we try to get more to give us comfort, but then we feel worse because things themselves drain us. The world drains us. Always, at all times. Things cause spiritual death. We can only have one master in this life, and the problem is, is that the more things we have, the more competitors there are. The more things we have is the more competitors we have for who is our master. It's not just having things, it's also wanting things. I know a lot of people who are poor, but are never happy, and they're always wanting more. See, it's, it's not so much whether you have the thing. I'm not talking about the upper or middle class. Middle class. I'm also talking about the lower class, too. People who continually want more. For those of you who have ever been stuck in alcoholism, when is the last, when, when is, what, what am I trying to say? What drink sustains you? None of them. You always need another drink. Proverbs puts it like this. When will I wake up so I can have another drink? It's not satisfying. And it's not just alcohol, it's everything that we, that we, that we invest our whole life, livelihood into. If you make your whole life about your house and, and, and all these different things, what happens if a catastrophe comes and your house is destroyed? Your life is wasted. And that's why Jesus says to invest our time in the heavenly things, the things that don't corrupt. Because one of these days, you're going to die. It's what happens to people. They die. And what happens to all that stuff that you accumulated? The only thing that is of real importance in this life are those things that don't corrupt. Those things that don't rust. The Word of God. Because God is making it as something better than we could ever have imagined. I want to give one more example of this, and that's working hard. Have you ever not had a job and spent your whole time in your house like watching TV? Your days are very unrestful, you don't sleep good, you have panic and anxiety, you just, everything starts to bother you, you're out tight all the time. What happens when you work really hard and then you get a day off? That leisure time is sacred. It's just magical formula. You work hard and then you get to play hard. And you know what? You don't even feel guilty on your day off. Because the day off isn't a time of, of mourning, it's a time of rejoicing. I have worked hard, I have earned this time off. And we find that the harder we work, the more our anxiety goes away. See, sometimes we have problems with anxiety and, and, and panic and those kinds of things because we sit on our butt all day and, and our, the energy in our body is building up. You know, the things that we eat are meant to give us energy. We're not supposed to live to eat. We eat to live. See, and so what happens is we eat these things that give us energy. Pay attention to how much sugar, grams of sugar, is in the food that you eat. So all that sugar is meant to give you energy. So then you eat all that sugar and you don't do anything. Well, of course you're going to have problems sleeping at night. 
See, sometimes we just make ourselves have problems because we always want instead of fixing our eyes on Jesus. What if happiness wasn't in not having to work? What if it wasn't in not having to worry about problems? What if happiness was something that could be found at any time of any day? What if? Um, so too much leisure time is, begins to be unenjoyable. And I already said that. So some of us, that's all we've ever known. Some of us in Tularosa have never had a full-time job or even a job. You know, and so we get to be in our 30s and 40s and we genuinely believe that we can't work because, I mean, I've, I've never done it before. So then you kind of start psyching yourself out. I, I won't be able to do this. Or you get a job and you keep it for a time and then you quit because your boss doesn't like you or you think that your boss is going to fire you or whatever. And so you go through this continual process. It just repeats itself. So some of us don't even know what it's like, but in Mark 4.19, he, he's explaining this parable. And this is, this is what he says. I'll actually I'll start in verse 18. And others are the ones on whom seed was sown among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard the word. So they heard the word, and there was growth. Verse 19, but the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires uh, for other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. So he actually mentions three different things, and if you're reading it through real quick, it sounds like these are all synonymous. They're all, they all go together. But these are actually three different things that deal with three er different areas of life. The first is, but the worries of the world. These are things like our job. These are things like our problems. Um, the things that come up that, that we have to have to resolve. Fads, like iPhones, or you know whatever fad you're into. It, and some, for some people it's clothes. Um, TV, games, uh, sports. These are the things that the, the worries of the world, and we get, they're consuming. But these things are kind of, they're distractions, but they're emotional. But the second thing that he mentions does, isn't so much emotional. And the deceitfulness of riches, they, these are more like the physical things, the belongings, wealth, uh, how much you can accumulate. These are things that override reason, right? You know one of the warnings about video games that they give is, if you feel disillusioned from reality, well, that doesn't sound good, does it? <laughs> they say, take a break for 15 minutes if you start to feel a, a disillusioned from reality. That's probably a sign that you're playing too many video games. And then the third thing that he says here, so we have worries of the world, that's the emotional stuff, right? The, the problems that come up, our job problems, all kinds of that, stuff like that. Then there's a deceitfulness of riches. This isn't just money, it's the pursuit of money. It isn't just owning things, it's things that's wanting to own things. The deceitfulness of riches. See, I said that deceitful. Think about that word. He didn't just say riches. He said the deceitfulness of riches. See, money has a way and belongings have a way of sinking their teeth into our lives. And before you know it, the thing is more important than the person. Have you ever taken, spent your whole life taking pictures of your kids and then one of your kids or one of your kids' dogs or whatever gets in there and accidentally ruins one of your photo albums? Mm -hmm. And you just want to rip their head off. Why? Because the thing has become so important to you that it's actually more important than the person. See what I mean? The deceitfulness of riches. How many times do kids spill milk and their parents go in there and just beat the tar out of them? Because they weren't listening because it was just spilled milk. It wasn't the end of the world. See what I mean? How many times you know, do, do you not want to spend time with people because you're concerned that they'll just mess up your house, they'll mess up your, your space, they'll, 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 they'll mess things up? Well, what's more important, the temporary place of your house or the eternal place of that person's soul? See, I mean, the deceitfulness of riches. Thinking that people, you know, when, when, here's another good example. When somebody steals from us, what's our first reaction? Anger. We feel violated, right? That was our thing. But what if it didn't matter? See, the thing is, none of us know when our time is up. Aneurysms, for instance, there can be no sign of an aneurysm. And it just happens, and you're dead. No, hey, watch out, hey, get into the doctor, you're dead. That's a scary thought. 
And for a young guy, I just started realizing that I'm mortal. And I don't like that. I, I was watching this show called Community, and there's this guy in there that works out a lot. His name's Jeff Winger. And uh, he goes in for his health eval, and he's all just joking around. And he's like, uh, and then the, the, the doctors are like, you have a little bit of high cholesterol, so you'll have to take these pills. And he goes through this total hard time. He says, I took care of this thing. I didn't eat junk food. I worked out. I made sure that I did all the right and healthy things. I wasn't supposed to have physical problems. I was supposed to live forever. And he started to realize that even though he worked out every day, even though he ate healthy and didn't eat all the unhealthy things, his body was still decaying. So let me just move through these, uh, this last thing really quickly, and that's uh, there at the end of the verse. And the desires for the and, desi and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word. So this is greed. These are more mental things. More money, better house, different spouse. So you have these emotional, physical, and mental things that steal our attention and suffocate us. And they all go to fight our spiritual man all the time. But the worries of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Ask yourself, what is in my life right now that is choking out my joy? Because I guarantee you that you will not find happiness in getting more things, but in having less things. Go through your house, start getting rid of junk. Give it away. I mean, if you haven't used it in the last six months, you probably aren't going to use it. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Why clutter up your house with a bunch of useless crap? Because this is what happens. I see it happen so many times. Parents die, they leave their stuff to their kids, their kids fight about it, and then half the stuff ends up going to Google anyways. Why? 1 John 2, 15-17 says, Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father. And the boastful pride of life Look how great I am. The world, the world is passing away, and also it, its lusts. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. These things are passing away. Boy, I tell you what, if I could go back and tell my, tell my teenager self, these, these passions and these crazy emotions that you're having, they don't last for forever. Most of the time, they die in your 20s anyways. But assuming they go to your 40s, let's just say worst case scenario, good God, I would, I'm so thankful that didn't happen. Let's say it goes to your 40s. We don't live that long as people. These, these are temporary afflictions that we have. And the thing is, we are only capable of giving so much attention. And when, we, when, when things steal our affection, we don't realize it changes us. Because things consume our affection. And you only have so much love in your life to spend. What are you going to spend it on? Some examples. People who have to feel like they have to upgrade their spouses. People who treat others different and then try and teach others to treat those same people different. That, that bitterness, is, bitterness that sets in. And you start trying to prove yourself. You start trying to prove how much better you are. People who won't work because they can't be told what to do. And they can't get along with others. The pride of life. People who live in credit card debt and spending money they don't have. Why? Well, because if I got this thing, you would make me happy. That thing is exactly what's making you not happy. And now you're stressed because you spent money you didn't have. See, I mean, it gets to be a lifestyle where it's not just our credit card, it goes to other things. People who think, so, think the rules don't apply to them. You see, I see a lot of people who smoke pot in Tularosa, but not legally. Not, they're not dying of cancer. You know, it's illegal recreational use of marijuana. That is illegal. <coughs> See what I mean? And back, I, I feel like, I feel like back in the day we didn't have to say don't break the law. But maybe I was just blind to it because I was a kid. Don't break the law. It's illegal for recreational pot smoking. Don't smoke pot. This shouldn't even be something that people have to say, I thought. Drinking and driving. You know how many people are after drink and drive? I don't know how it is in the rest of the world. I don't live in the rest of the world. In New Mexico, it's very bad. Well, I'm just buzzed. A, it's still illegal. See, people who think the rules don't apply to them. So, going down in Mark 4.20, he gives us the solution to all this. 
I forgot I wanted to read one more verse. Sorry. And those uh, are the ones on whom seed was sown on the good soil, and they hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirty, sixty, and a hundredfold. Develop your, your soul, not wealth and worldly possessions. Don't waste your time developing wealth. Don't waste your time developing worldly possessions. I'm not saying don't invest. I'm not saying that at all. That's a good thing to do. I'm not saying live foolish. I'm not saying that at all. You should make sure that you have enough money to pay the next month rent, that you have backup money, that you have uh oh money. These are all good things. But there comes a point when your life is about wealth, when your life is about possessions, when your life is about getting the next thing. And that's what I'm talking about. So by all means, you know, have pensions, you know, whatever. That's fine. But remember that your life is but a breath. If it's not spent in the pursuit of God, it's to not no avail. Ecclesiastes says this, how pointless it is to do these things. Because once you die, it goes on to somebody after you that you don't even know if they're going to do a good job or not. That's what Ecclesiastes says. So then he says this at the very end of the book. All these things considered, treasure God in your younger days. And then do that throughout the course of your life. Because all these other things are pointless otherwise. You can die and be buried in a grave rich, and you can die and be buried in a grave poor. But ultimately, the same is true for both. They both die. So this is, this is my main point here. Things don't satisfy. How can you be happy right now in fixing your eyes on Jesus Christ? So just a few more things I want to say here. Do not be angry that you don't have as others do. Be thankful you don't have the greater temptation. If you're poor, be thankful that you're poor. That's less stuff you have to worry about. If you're rich, don't rejoice in the, in the fact that you're better than other people. Rejoice in the fact that God gave you the means to bless others. Use your time and your wealth wisely. And don't waste your time and your life striving after things that don't matter. It's not worth it. You'll get to the end of your life, you'll be lying on your deathbed, and you'll say, what a waste of time. What a waste of time. So don't, don't do that. How do you develop your soul? By hearing the word and accepting it, by bearing fruit. If we always spend our lives as Christians serving ourselves, that's not really Christianity. So I want to close with a few questions to ask yourself. What do I spend my time, and what do I spend my money on? That will tell you where your affections are. Look at your credit card statements. Look at your, che your, your checking account statements. Where's your money going? That will tell you. Every time that you do anything besides work, write it on a timesheet as if you're doing work. Um, if you play a video game, okay, check in at this time. Check out at this time, just like you would at work. Um, if you go for a walk, check in at this time. Check out at this time. And then add that up at the end of the week and say, where's my time going? That will tell you where your heart is at. What does my future look like? If I keep the same course I'm at now, what, what does that look like in the future? This will show you where your affections are set. And the last question, what is holding my heart? What can I not do without? What would I be terrified to lose? Terrified to lose. Now, this list is for yourself, so don't lie to yourself. Oh, my kids, or my dog, you know, whatever. That, that's good, and I'm sure those things would matter. I, I'm, I'm not saying that. But... Really delve into your heart and say, what is holding my heart? What would I genuinely be upset to lose? Well, I've got this car that I really like. I just bought this, this whatever. This is what it's all about. What would you be genuinely hurt to lose? We're going to go ahead and close there. Um, if I could, uh, well, I'm going to close in prayer, and then Joe, if you could pray for the uh, food whenever I'm done, okay? Lord, I pray that you would help us to search our hearts truthfully and honestly. Help us to see what things are holding our hearts and help us not to set our hope on the things of this world. And help us not to set our time and our efforts all on the things of this world. Help us to look past those things and to fix our eyes on those things that moths can't destroy, that time won't destroy, and that will never be destroyed. Help us build into a kingdom that is never passing, and that's your kingdom. Help us to set our affections on you. Help us to set our time on you. Lord, take, take our lives and mold it where we have one master who is you. 
Lord, and I thank you for what you're doing. Help us to be a good seed that produces forward. Help us not to be all about ourselves, but help us to be about your kingdom. We love you. Amen.